Hello everybody, this is Rob Swatsky from the York Campus of Hack, and welcome back to my Biology 121 Anatomy and Physiology 1 course. This is podcast 1.4b, Negative and Positive Feedback Systems. Feedback systems can be either negative or positive. Negative feedback systems work at maintaining homeostasis by generating output that negates or turns off the stimulus, which returns the controlled condition back to its normal range. If the stimulus increases the controlled condition, negative feedback systems reverse the stimulus and bring the controlled condition back down to normal. If the stimulus decreases the control condition, negative feedback systems again reverse the stimulus and bring the control condition back up to normal. Negative feedback systems are the most common of the two feedback systems and work 24-7 to constantly regulate the body's daily activities in order to maintain a stable state over time. Let's examine an example of a common negative feedback system, the regulation of blood pressure. We're going to use the same feedback system components that were reviewed in podcast 1.4a. Blood pressure is the amount of force generated by blood as it pushes against the blood vessel walls. A stimulus, like the stress one feels before an important exam, causes the heart to beat faster, which increases blood pressure. There are specialized nerve receptors in the walls of blood vessels called baroreceptors that are sensitive to changes in blood pressure and detect the increase. The baroreceptors generate input in the form of nerve impulses to the control center, which is the brain. The brain takes in this input, processes the information, and generates output in the form of nerve impulses to the effectors, which are the heart and blood vessels. The heart responds by decreasing the rate of contraction of its cardiac muscle cells, and the smooth muscles in the blood vessels dilate or increase their diameter, which results in a decrease in blood pressure. The drop in blood pressure then feeds back to the baroreceptors, which detect this decrease, and the controlled condition of blood pressure is returned back to its normal homeostatic range. Positive feedback systems are the opposite of negative feedback systems in that their responses increase the strength of the stimulus rather than reverse it. Positive feedback systems are not as common as negative feedback systems, but are incredibly important when they occur and will continue functioning until some outside mechanism stops the process. A great example of a positive feedback system is childbirth. The first labor contractions of childbirth push the baby's head into the cervix, which is the lowest part of the uterus or womb. These labor contractions act as the stimulus that increases the stretching of the cervix, the controlled condition. The receptors in this feedback system are specialized stretch receptor nerve cells in the cervix that send input in the form of nerve impulses about the increased stretching to the brain, the control center.
as a result of this input, the brain releases a hormone called oxytocin into the bloodstream as its output. Oxytocin causes the effectors, the muscles of the uterus, to contract even more forcefully than before. This results in the baby being pushed further down the uterus, which further stretches the cervix. This increased stretch then feeds back to the stretch receptors, which cause the brain to release more oxytocin, which triggers even stronger contractions of the uterus. This cycle will continue until the baby is born, the stretching of the cervix stops, and the positive feedback cycle is broken. Some other examples of positive feedback systems include the blood clotting reactions to stop blood loss and the inflammation response of the body's immune system. A healthy body is one where all of the homeostatic mechanisms are working efficiently and all of the body's controlled conditions are maintained within their normal ranges. Disruptions of homeostasis are called homeostatic imbalances. If any of the body's negative or positive feedback mechanisms fail to work properly, this delicate balancing act of homeostasis can be thrown off and a disorder, disease, or death may occur. Any abnormal structure or function of the body is described using the general term of disorder. A disease is a more specific term for an illness having a definite set of signs and symptoms. Diseases can be local, affecting a small region or one area of the body, like an ear infection, or they can be systemic and affect several areas or the entire body, like cardiovascular disease. Symptoms of a disease are subjective changes in body functions that are not visible to an observer, such as anxiety and headaches. Signs, on the other hand, are objective changes that are both observable and measurable, such as rashes, fevers, or high blood pressure. For practice, let's try to diagnose a disease using symptoms and signs. Can you name this disease from these four symptoms? Thirst, headache, nausea, and blurry vision? Pretty tough, huh? These symptoms could describe any number of possible diseases. How about now if we consider these two signs? A fasting plasma glucose test greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter and a hemoglobin A1C test indicating high average blood glucose over 6 to 12 weeks. These are signs of diabetes and it is often easier to determine a disease from the more objective and quantifiable data that signs provide. Thanks for watching and please feel free to contact me by email at rjswatsk at hack.edu if you have any questions or comments about the course.